Good morning, everybody. We're glad you're here again today. Uh, last week, we kind of really hit on this idea from Jesus, um, and we see it in our culture too, that when you hear something, you usually bring some other something to the table. If you hear a line from a movie or a line from a TV show, usually the whole thing comes along with the entire story, the background, the connection, it all kind of connects with who we are. Um, however, I'll make a correction today a little bit, because that's true that when you may say a line from a movie, it connects if you know the story, if you share the same story as the person giving you the line. And, and so just kind of illustrate that, I've got some lines from movies here. Um, I'm going to see if they connect, right? So if, if you know what movie this comes from, why don't you raise your hand, okay? You ready? First one, super easy. Do or do not, there is no try. Raise your hand, Erica. All right, where's it from? The Empire Strikes Back, spoken by Yoda. All right, how about this one? We're gonna need a, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Okay, about half of you, where's it from? Jaws, okay. How about this one? I'll be back. Maybe, maybe, I thought of this myself. Welcome back, Cotter. Who's seen that show beside me? Yeah, like four of us. <laughs> Travolta was in that show. Welcome, okay, never mind. All right, how about, the, in fact, it was from the Terminator, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, how about this one? It's just two words, and one's not even a word. Yo, Adrian. Yeah, Rocky, the first one. Okay, this one's, this one's tough. I don't think anybody got it last hour. Life is tough, but it's tougher if you're stupid. Now, this is not what Stacy said to me this morning before coming to church. All right? Anybody know where this came, comes from? John Wayne, 1949, the Sands of Iwo Jima. This is his most fam famous saying. All right, anyway, I thought it was good. All right, I got two more. How about this one? Okay, it's true, it is from Frozen, right, let it go. It's also, though, from Rambo. If you know this, but Rambo said this, let it go, right, let it go, let it go. Okay, so last one is this one right here. Beam me up, Scotty. Where's it from? Nowhere. Erica kept her hand down, that was smart. This was never spoken in the movies or the TV show. It's Scotty, comma, beam me up, but never beam me up, Scotty. So you learned something today. All right, anyhow. All right, here's the thing. It is true, though, we hear these lines. If we know the background, if we know the story, they connect. When Jesus last week spoke this word of darkness from the cross, he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was quoting the first verse of Psalm 22. And it was this connection to darkness, the darkness he was experiencing, the darkness we experience, but it had this ray of hope at the end of the psalm, that the sun was going to return. Darkness would flee. God wins. And it, and it kind of brought all that, that whole package, to that moment in the fourth word, Jesus speaks from the cross. And in fact, all the words from the cross will connect with us at different levels based on where our story is at. So maybe for you, that first word, the word of forgiveness, when Jesus speaks, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Maybe that connects with you because you feel you need forgiveness at this moment. Or maybe it's that second word, word of grace, where he turns to the self-proclaimed criminal and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Maybe you need to hear those words of hope and of pardon. Or maybe it's the word of love that he speaks to his mom. Woman, here's your son. And how he speaks to John who just a few hours had abandoned him. A few hours before, left him. And now he's back at the foot of the cross with Jesus and he speaks to John and says, and here's your mother. I'm welcoming you back to the family, John. Right there at that moment offers him love and reconciliation and care. Maybe that's what you need to hear today too. Well, today, in this fifth word from the cross, Jesus doesn't speak to others. He doesn't speak to God. He's going to speak a word for himself. Your friend, my friend, Jesus of Nazareth, is on the cross, and today he speaks a word of need. 
In the Gospel of John 19, it says this. When Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill Scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put it, a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. I am thirsty. It's one word in Greek, just one. Yet it is so basic. We've all said that at some point in our life because we need it. It is one of our basic needs. Food, air, shelter, water. If you're familiar with wilderness survival, there's this thing called the, the rule of threes. The rule of threes. And it says that you can only survive three minutes without oxygen, three hours without shelter in a harsh environment, three days without water, and three weeks without food. The rule of threes. We need these basic things. And sometimes not even that long. I have two teenage boys. If they go an hour without dinner, what do I hear? Dad, I'm starving, right? Or in a long road trip going somewhere like California, I'm parched, followed by, I have to go to the bathroom. I don't know how those two work together. But then we get to this point where you just need these things and they're very, very basic. And Jesus says, I'm thirsty. And we thirst, but not like this. He's been hanging on the cross for hours. Some doctors suggest he hasn't had any kind of fluids or water for over 20 hours. And through lips that are parched and broken, he says, I'm thirsty. Jesus was truly, fully, really human. And I think sometimes we kind of forget that. We overlook that simple fact. We think of him as God, right? I mean, we see the miracles. We talk about his teaching, how he could cure the blind, make the deaf hear, the lame walk, tell demons to hit the bricks. He can make the dead rise. He can do all these things that we can often forget that he was human. Or we think that, you know, when things got tough, when he was tempted, he'd play like a God card. Oh, sorry, God card. So that he never really got angry or frustrated or never stubbed his toe or never got a sore back from sleeping on the ground, that he was immune to all that stuff. Or when bad things happened, he would just kind of, oh, I'm just God, it's okay. In fact, some early Christians couldn't deal with the fact that God was human that God would take part in our lives, that God would be in the muck and the messiness of who we are. And so they began to teach that Jesus really wasn't human. I mean, he looked human, he appeared human, but he was fully God. And so he could avoid all the messiness. He can just kind of not get his feet dirty in our lives. That a holy God would not be betrayed or beaten or humiliated or hungry or tortured, or thirsty. God doesn't do that. And they taught that. That's simply not true. The Bible doesn't teach that. Jesus didn't have a God card, a get out of human experience free card. He got just as tired, just as frustrated, just as beaten down, broken, hungry, thirsty as you or I. The book of Hebrews says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin, in every way. So a fully human, Jesus speaks a word of humanity. I'm thirsty, like we would. When he gets tired, he takes a nap. When he gets angry, he turns over tables in the temple. When he gets distracted, disappointed or hurt by his friends when they betray him, he feels it. When he gets hungry, he eats. And sometimes with tax collectors and sinners, he understands our pain. He knows what we're going through. So don't miss that in this simple word, I'm thirsty. In fact, a lot of people have come to know God because when they were hurting, in that moment, they were in pain, Someone had the brains enough to say, Jesus understands. He knows what you're going through in a very real way. 
And he simply shared that one simple fact with them. But you look at John's text today, John 19, 28, and you see that even John says there's more going on here than Jesus being thirsty. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, and then John adds like in parentheses, in order to fulfill scripture, I am thirsty. It, it kind of bugged me at first, like why include that? Can't he just be thirsty? Can't he just ask for something without having to quote scripture? Can he just be human for a minute, John? But maybe John is referring to something else, something deeper that Jesus is saying here in these very human words. In order for scripture to be fulfilled, what scripture is he talking about? Last week it was Psalm 22, and it connected with suffering and hope. Well, Psalm 69 verse 21 says this, they gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And sure enough, it says the soldiers probably took some cheap wine that they drank sitting there watching everybody die, put it on a sponge, and gave them, gave it to Jesus so he had something to drink. Well, Psalm 69, like Psalm 22, is one of hope. Yeah, it's a, there's terrible suffering in it, but in the end, there's hope of one who trusts in God even in the difficult times. Maybe that's the connection John is talking about. Or maybe there's something even deeper. One of my favorite authors is a guy named Gregory Nanzianzus. And he was the Archbishop of Constantinople in the fourth century. In fact, my youngest son, Luke, is named Luke Gregory after this guy. And he was a great writer, one of the best of his day. And he was really, really good about making these very simple connections about Jesus in the Bible. Just very, very simple. You don't even see they're even there, but it's amazing how he does it. And in one case, one of his sermons, he was kind of connecting this Jesus as God with Jesus as, as being human. And he wrote this. He, Jesus, was tired, yet he is the rest of the weary and the burdened. He is weakened and wounded, Yet he cures every disease and every weakness. He pays tax, yet he uses a fish to do it. He prays, yet he hears prayer. He weeps, yet he puts an end to weeping. He hungered, yet he fed thousands. He thirsted, yet he exclaimed, whoever thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Indeed, he promised that believers would become fountains. He has given vinegar to drink, gall to eat. And who is he? Why, the one who turned water into wine. In this little section at the end, he kind of captures what's going on here at the cross. He remembers Jesus saying, I am thirsty. He remembers Psalm 69, that gave me vinegar to drink. He remembers the wedding at Cana, when he turned water into wine. And he also remembers another story from earlier in John. Whoever thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He remembers a story in John 4. And it's an important story. It's the longest conversation that Jesus has with any individual in the Bible. And in this story, Jesus is going down from in Galilee to Jerusalem. And instead of going around about, he's going to go through an area called Samaria. It's this green area here on the screen. And most Jews avoided it like the plague because like all the the you know, bad folks, the yucky folks kind of live there. So they would go around it, way out of their way. But Jesus takes his disciples and cuts straight through the heart of Samaria. Well, they're going along, and it gets hot, and they get hungry and tired. And so they stop at the well of Jacob. And he sends the disciples off to go get some food in town. And he sits there at the well. Well, about noon, a woman comes to the well to draw water for her family. Now, here's the thing. We live in a desert. We get thirsty. Now, if you had to go and take a big, huge jar to a well and bring it home, what time of day would you go in Phoenix in the summer? Anybody? 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 6.30 p.m., 8 p.m., you know, in the evening and when the sun's down. Would anybody go at noon? 
And there's no way you're going to go at noon. She goes at noon to get water. Why do you think she goes at noon? Because no one's going to be there. Right? She doesn't want to see anybody. She doesn't want to be around people. Most folks go to the water cooler to tell jokes, you know, catch up. Not her. When she goes to the water cooler, she is the joke. She's an outcast. She's been ostracized. And so she goes off by herself in the hot part of the day to get water. Well, she's there. When she gets there, there's Jesus sitting there. And he says to her, can I have a drink? She says, you asking me? A woman? A Samaritan woman? You Jews have nothing to do with us. Why are you asking me? What do you really want? Jesus wants a drink. I'm sure that's very honest. If I was thirsty, it's noon, it's hot, he's been walking all day. But he also notices that she's there at noon. There's a reason that she's there. Maybe there's some decisions that she doesn't want to face. Some things in her past she doesn't want to deal with. So Jesus kind of cuts to the chase. He asks her a drink, and then he says this. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? What do you mean living water? I mean, look, she doesn't, she stays on the surface, right? He's talking about something else. She's stuck on the water. Well, where's your bucket? How long is your rope? Where do you get this living water from, right? She's thinking about the water itself. How often in our lives does God want to get under the surface, get to the deeper things, and we want to kind of keep it on the surface, kind of keep it up here, right? We pray but just at meals when it's safe, when we're supposed to. Or Bible study is just that, just a study, looking at the Bible, what it says. We don't let it actually penetrate who we are and what we do. Just keep it on the surface, Jesus. Don't dig too deep. This woman has to deal with her real needs, her real identity, her real purpose. Maybe like her, we don't want God to deep, dig deep down below the surface to get to our real needs or our real purpose. So we ignore the question. We just kind of keep it, hi Jesus, how's the weather? How are things with you? And don't get any deeper than that. Well, Jesus with her is not going to let it go. Verse 13, he said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them become, will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. What is she concerned about? Really? Not coming back here anymore. Like, I don't want to come back here at noon anymore. It's hot. I'm sick of being gossiped about. I'm sick of being talked about. I'm sick of everybody looking at me funny. I'm tired of all that stuff. Give me the water so that I don't have to come here anymore. Right? She's stuck on the immediate problem. Same with us. We get these immediate things going on, and instead of getting at what drove us to that point, we're stuck on fixing the problem. Fix this, God. Fix this mess right here. Fix that. But don't deal with the stuff that got me there. Don't deal with this stuff just fix this. Give me enough water so I don't have to come back here and be made fun of. But let's not talk about the decisions I made that made me come to the well at noon. In fact, she doesn't even talk about eternal life. He mentions water leading to eternal life. She like, totally blows that off. Eternal life, yeah, whatever. Jesus is saying to you and me here, look, if you come to this kind of well and this kind of water, you're going to be satisfied for a little while, but then you're going to come back here tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that, because you'll be thirsty again. He says, the water I'm going to give you is inside of you, and it lasts forever. It's something deeper that satisfies longings in us 
that we sometimes don't even want to take a look at. In Jeremiah, the prophet is talking to people centuries before this, and you see the exact same thing that God is saying to those people way back then. He says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. He's saying, look, I'm offering you living water that lasts, that satisfies, that takes care of you. I'm offering you that. What you want are these old cisterns, these kind of dug out holes with the stagnant, you know, green, slimy, mosquito infilled, infested water. You want that and wonder why you're always thirsty. Well, we want the surface stuff. Just keep it surface. And God's like, if you want to fix the problem, you've got to get down to the root of it, where living water exists. Well, Jesus isn't going to let it go here either. So it finally kind of smashes through the surface. And he says to her, tell you what, go home, bring your husband back. And she says, well, I've got no husband. Which is true. It's just not fully accurate. So in John 7, 4, 17, Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Surface is true. But he's going to smash right through, through that, and he says, look, enough. Enough of this. Enough of the excuses. Enough of the surface. Enough of the little easy conversations. This woman has been looking to be satisfied, to find what love is, to feel accepted and cared for, and to care for others. But she's been doing it by bouncing off relationship to relationship to relationship and ignoring the fact that there's a God who defines what love is, that loves her, and she doesn't trust in that wants to go to a different well. We all have these kinds of wells. Maybe we're like her. We have these wells of relationship where we do, we, we lean on other people. Well, I'll feel satisfied if I have this one person who will complete me. And we lean on that. We trust in that. It's not going to satisfy, not ultimately. Or we have wells of power or success. But power and success will never bring us purpose. It'll never satisfy or maybe you have wells of performance or pleasing people. If I please, or if I please folks or I do really well, then I'll be satisfied. There's that next goal, that next thing I got to do, the next person doesn't like me. What about wells of financial security or possessions? The more I have, if I just get comfortable and not worry about money, but there's always that next thing. Jesus says to us again and again, these other wells are not going to satisfy. They will for a little while, but you keep coming back again and again and again every day at noon, ignoring the deeper things that are going on. So what is living water? What is he talking about, really, in a practical, functional way? Psalm 63 says this, O God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water, because your steadfast love is better than life. I think it's simply that. Knowing and believing and trusting that God actually loves us. Enough to participate in humanity, to be with us, to die for us, to thirst for us. For us. To know that is life. That Jesus died in pain and thirsty as part of humanity to show us that his steadfast love is there. That he'll hang out with us at wells at noon. Help us get down to the root of the problem and to give us living water inside of us that lasts forever. Bob Weber was a former president of Kiwanis, and he would go around the country speaking to different places. And one time he spoke at a small town, small farm, you know, kind of Midwest. In the afternoon, he was with a farmer, kind of on the front porch, just, you know, enjoying the afternoon. 
Well, a little boy came to deliver the paper. Remember those days when they should deliver the newspaper? So he comes by and, and there's a sign out front that says, puppies for sale. So the little boy asks the farmer, how much for the puppies? He says, well, $25. Yeah, I don't have that kind of money. Can I see him though? Can I just look at him? So the farmer whistles and around the corner come these little fur balls, little puppies come right around the corner. And they're cute and they're jumping, playing. And about a minute later, a minute or two later, a little one comes kind of hobbling around the house. He's got one bad leg. The little boy sees that puppy. He's like, man, his eyes light up. He's excited. He says, I want that puppy. He says, I don't have the money for it, but I'll pay you 50 cents today and 50 cents every week so I pay off that 25 bucks, but I want that puppy. And the farmer says, well, look, son, that, it's lame. It's got a bad hip from birth. It's never going to run or jump. You can't play fetch with that dog. Why do you want that puppy? The little boy grabs his pants and he pulls up the leg of the pants and you can see this brace where his leg had been kind of crippled from polio, twisted and injured. The little boy says, you see, that puppy needs someone who understands. Jesus came to our world as a human, thirsty, hungry, crippled for us. Because we have someone now who understands and knows what it's like. And yet he's also someone who will sit there with us at a well in the heat of the day at noon and help us dig past the surface of purpose and meaning in our lives and offer us true living water that will really satisfy our deepest longings in our lives. He loves us. His love is steadfast and forever. It's up for us, though, to go to him and accept that love, that water that he's offering us today.